So guys, uh, Freddy's left us because he had some work to do. But uh, right now we're also <laughs> going to be talking about uh, the dark side of uh, the IPL or the 2020 game in particular. And since we're talking dark side, we got uh, a dark personality and uh, Siddhant Ani joining us on the show uh, for his, uh, you know, whatever expert analysis on this. But let's 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 talk to you, Tim, first and foremost. Uh, while there is the good of what's happening in the field and you know the economy is booming, the cricket economy is booming, yeah, courtesy yeah. of the 2020 game. Uh, there is a dark side to it as well fixing, doping, and so on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and in some ways, just the, sheer, the, the, the popularity of T20 has created all these problems. I mean, most simple, we have so many matches played. So every year now, we have over 700 games of T20 played around the world. And almost all these games, they're all they're all televised or live streamed and they, and you can bet on them. And basically, if you, if you can bet on them, there's a possibility of corruption. And although we've seen some corruption in the IPL, um, the biggest worry um, anti-corruption bodies have, they have it's, it's, low, slightly, it's lower leagues and lower levels of international cricket where the players might not be paid a lot and you still have huge amounts of money bet. So we, we for example, um, we think that the Afghan Premier League, there's, there might be 600 million US dollars bet on every match, which is an incredible <laughs> amount. And like around, that's around the world. And most, the vast majority of that money is with illegal bookmakers and it's very, very hard to trace. But we know from what's bet on a legal book, on, through legal means, it's like to be in the region of five, 600 million US dollars. And the point is, therefore, you know, players in that league who are paid the least they could be very vulnerable because they might think, I might only play a few matches of this league ever. I might be out of a job, you know, in a, literally a few weeks' time. So, it's, and, and it might be like, well, I probably I probably would have failed anyway. I probably would have, would have got under 10 runs anyway. So if someone mm. offers you money to guarantee to get under 10 runs, you can see why that's very tempting. And we see the level of anti-corruption ed- education around the world. It's a bit haphazard. It's not as good as it, as it should be. So there's a need to do a lot more to safeguard the integrity of, of the game. Otherwise, we will, you know, there's already you know, almost every league has had problems. Um, we've had problems in, in the IPL, the T20 Blast, in the Pakistan Super League as well, in the, in the Bangladesh Premier League. So, all, and, and that's just what, what, what we know. So there is the fear that's sort of the tip of the iceberg and more needs to be done, you know, to, to control things. Otherwise, we could have a situation almost like cricket in the 1990s again. And, and Tim, uh, these leagues are going to keep popping up, right? Because uh, if one thing administrators have learned... It's these small leagues come in quickly, play a few games and get out. And that sort of works economically from an administrator or an organizer's point of view. Well, no, no, this interesting thing is that actually a lot of leagues, we, we looked really deep and a lot of leagues are not making money. It took the IPL five, six, seven, eight years for teams to be sure of, of making money. And in fact, it was only really the bump in New Deal, which began at the end of 17, that meant all teams were safely in profit. So a lot of these leagues, they actually, what they do, they actually, they tend to overestimate the number of Indian viewers they'll get. So we saw, for example, this global T20 league in South Africa that was predicated partly on having loads of Indian viewers. So they had three Indian owners and they thought Indian cricket fans would watch because of Indian owners and, and they realized that was not going to happen. So the league went bust before it even started. So actually we see it's a bit of a kind of a wild west of leagues is what, what people say. So you have in this mad scramble to create leagues, you know, teams are spending, uh, leagues are spending more than they can afford and then these leagues get into big trouble. And of course that feeds into fixing as well because if you're a player and you kind of, you sense something is not is not quite is not all right. So we saw, you know, in the Canada League last year, there was you know players got on the team bus and they refused to, to get off because they hadn't been paid. This was you know over halfway through the tournament, and so if you're in a league like that where you're worried where you, you you're worried you might not get paid from the league, clearly then you might be more vulnerable to match fixing because all the evidence on on match fixing well it says it says a couple of things. It says when you play. When you play in matches which have a large TV audience, lots of money, there's there's bet around the world, and you're not paid mm. very well, you'll be yeah. very vulnerable to fixing. And it also says if you're playing in a match when some of your teammates are played a lot and you're paid very little, you'll be probably jealous and more inclined to fix. And and that's true. A lot of leagues, you often get players, you know, who are on a few hundred thousand for the league, and some who are on very very little indeed. So you have, you know, you might your teammate might be earning fifty times as much money as you for, for the same amount of work. Like yeah. you wouldn't be human if you weren't jealous and a bit resentful in that situation. But then, uh, Tim, uh, would I be jumping the gun and saying? So I'll flip the question with a lot of these small, uh, so obscure leagues coming also, around. Just, yeah. Just to add one quick point on this, we're we're talking here specifically about players, of course. But there are also uh, sort of referees involved or umpires involved in the case of cricket who are inevitably even paid far less than what the lowest earning players playing uh, is, is, is earning through the league. And 
therefore they and they get far fewer games etc etc and which also makes them susceptible and targets to uh, influencing outcomes i mean especially in a game like cricket where the umpire has a literally ball by ball uh, role to play and technology comes in and all of that of course but but uh, yeah just that much. yeah umpires officials could be vulnerable we've seen a big uh umpire fixing scandal in the NBA basketball league and there's definitely possibility of that in, in T20 leagues as well so another reason to be vigilant I mean with with DRS so that makes it maybe a little bit harder but I mean, yeah. there's still there's still vulnerabilities there potentially uh, let me flip that question for you uh, all these obscure leagues that are popping up all over the world and they keep coming every 2 3 years um uh, and i'm not i'm not just saying about uh, a country doing a league i'm saying about local leagues say domestic leagues that are happening within yeah a- yeah Yeah, uh, so would, I, would I be it, right yeah. in saying a lot of these leagues, like you mentioned, they're not making money? So then, are they solely being set up from the purpose of a fixing angle, or am well, I jumping the gun? I need to be need to be careful about about what what we say here. But yeah. what we do know, there was that league in the UAE, um, the Ajman All Stars, and and basically that was set up. explicitly to fix. Is is uh, this the one where people are losing their wicket just for the Yeah, yeah, you might have seen the yeah. yeah, yeah, I mean some of those stump things. I mean it's worse than me playing cricket. It's, it's yeah. quite it's extraordinary that ineptitude. Um but that that's an extreme example. But I think there is the there is that worry that again you, you the vetting of the owners is not always as good as it should be and that mm. you potentially you create a situation where owners by a team they realize they're losing loads of money well they might think the only way to get their money back is to ensure their team loses and bet against their team i mean yeah we obviously we need to be careful about our, our words here but yeah there are big vulnerabilities there potentially so if i were to compare say an ajman league over here with their practices as far as anti corruption and doping is concerned and then you have ipl how far yeah. ahead is the ipl in terms of keeping those practices afloat yeah it, it's a, a different league altogether but could there be more done yes there could and there's also the IPL still has a big issue like what does it do the 10 months year when there's not the IPL on you know how much is it is it safeguarding players then because again if you're if you're a fringe local indian player in the IPL and you're you know say you're in the 30s and you're you're not a brilliant player and you might think you know every season could be your your last well there's every chance that you know a few months before the IPL you get you get approached and then and then you have you you can make an agreement or something which is contingent upon you playing and then you don't have any contact with with them during the IPL when you'll be monitored more more closely and then afterwards mm. you know you might get your payment or whatever so yeah i think even you're focusing IPL, on doping right now is that is that what you're pointing to no that's talking about in in match fixing yeah um, yeah you, you could be approached by corruptors but it actually yeah it similarly applies to to doping you could you could dope outside the leagues and i think there's a real the cricket's anti doping code is nowhere near as good as it should be so the icc's whereabouts testing it only applies to the top 8 odi nations at, at the moment which even meant west indies and afghanistan in the world cup you know they they were not uh, part of that they, they obviously have their own national anti doping programs um and there's anti doping testing in leagues as well but you know I did the numbers for our book and you know most most leagues they do a few dozen anti doping tests um in an entire league season which means most players don't even get once i mean that that is a big vulnerability and we and we saw what happened with in baseball sort of 15 years ago where it was absolutely rife um and there's a concern that you know cricket is is not doing enough to safeguard itself against against doping this time as well and because simply because in the history of cricket doping actually generally hasn't been that much of an advantage until T20 but with T20 clearly if you can hit the ball another 5 10 meters from the same shot you know that could put another zero on on your your paycheck come the IPL auction then uh, in one of the chapters of your book cricket 2.0 you guys have done a comparison as far as uh, anti doping tests and all are concerned and you've done the comparison in major league baseball and i think the IPL what's the number yeah, like so we- We've done the comparison between Major League Baseball and all cricket around the world according to the ICC. So, so you've the, taken yeah. international cricket as well. All cricket, yeah, and yeah. and local tests. So what we find there was twenty seven thousand tests in Major and Minor League Baseball combined, and in cricket around the world only fourteen hundred. So there's nineteen <laughs> times more tests in baseball in one country than in cricket throughout the world, and obviously more people play cricket than baseball. A lot more people play cricket than baseball. So that's a huge vulnerability there potentially because. you know the the value of steroids potentially for a T20 player is is massive because it means you can clear the ropes more and you find you're getting you'll you'll get more contracts in leagues around the world and you'll be earning a lot more having much much better career so there's a massive potential incentive to dope if the testing is not good enough from an administrator's point of view is it burning a hole in your pocket to uh, get these tests done or is that the reason why they're not happening at a regular pace in cricket 
So there is obviously some testing done, but I think, yeah, I think finances are always a barrier to doing more testing, especially, and especially what we find is the testing itself is not everything. So what we, what you really need to catch dope is you need intelligence, basically the intelligence community. And, and that does cost mo money because that can be, you can be doing a lot of work just to catch a couple of people. Um, mm. And there is some, some good work being done, some very good work being done, but it probably is not nearly as well resourced as it, as it should be. And there's also a, an unhealthy difference from country to country, um, which means that in some countries you could probably dope and you're, I mean, there's always a chance of getting caught, of course, but your chances are pretty minuscule. And also, you know, not every player, of course, reaches IPL standard, big bash standards. So if you're on the kind of what I call the, the tier two or tier three circuit, so you're you're playing a bit in, in Bangladesh, you might play in, in Nepal, you might play in the, Can in the Canada League, you can still make a good living and the chance of being testing are pretty minuscule. So we found in in some leagues, uh, the Caribbean Premier League had zero testing, big fat zero. I mean, that is that's shocking, really. Yeah. So, so in a sense, uh, you, I don't know where you th what you think about it. Uh, the Andre Russell suspension, it seemed more like making a statement and uh, doing some PR that here we are, we're doing it because in your book you've written that post getting caught, he's gone and played a lot of cricket as well, and he's won quite a few titles. Well, no, he's obviously a fantastic player, and I mean, he he's. He's been given a ban and he, he's served it in full. So, you know, from that point of view, you know, there's nothing that that's what's happened. Um, but I think it's fair to say that what happened there is likely to be the tip of the iceberg in the T20 game more 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 broadly. Um, and we see, we actually just see, just just using our own eyes, we see yeah. the physique of batsmen is getting more and more every year. So you see, from we you. Know, even the build of sort of a Sachin Tendulkar, you do not really get that in. That's now very unusual in T20 cricket. The, the build of oh. Andre Russell, those sorts of guys. The bats are getting taller, they're getting broader. And yeah, the potential, I mean, yeah, there's certainly potential there to benefit a lot, a lot from doping. And is, is enough being done to put people off doping? I would say, I would say no. Oh. And you want to add something, bro? Maybe not doping, but the conversations you've had with Mr. AKA Modi? <laughs> It's, uh, I don't know, we can get into it later on more specifically. I can pull out actual quotes and stuff. I don't want to say stuff in, in this context that's like even a little, a little bit off. But, but no, I, I did have like a couple of questions for Tim if you have a couple of minutes. Like, for example, are sure. there any countries that, uh, that within their at least national anti doping establishment are more proactive in their cricket association? And this might be associate nations like the Dutch, maybe, for example, I don't know. Uh, who are doing a little more to uh, sort of monitor and, and follow anti-doping code and also consequently at yeah, the fixing part as well? Um, no, I think it obviously, it, it probably depends on the national governments and their priorities. So we find in general countries that are a bit wealthier, they tend to have more sophisticated yeah. Uh, programs on doping we also find in countries where physical sports are more popular and it's been more of a history prior history of doping they, they do more testing so you know in australia where you have aussie rules in new zealand where you have obviously rugby union mm -hmm. in the uk to an extent as well there's a there's a decent history of, of doping anti-doping testing in some parts of the subcontinent where there's not those you know, those sports like rugby are not nearly as, as popular. There's there's been there's just been fewer doping scandals in other sports, and probably the the national anti-doping infrastructure is not quite caught up. But I don't think any country, when it comes to cricket, is doing enough to be honest. Yeah, for example, India's anti-doping lab lost its WADA accreditation recently. So now, even just and when with the virus and everything, uh, just. Getting samples out for testing and getting results back and, and getting people in labs to do the work, it's a hugely uh, problematic thing. And uh, already, I mean, sets of guidelines are going out from uh, the sports authority and the ministry and stuff like that to try and keep a check on uh, what happens or what athletes get up to in this period. But you also know now, so the Olympics have been given new dates, right? So Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's you probably a good time. It's a good time to be a doper now. Yeah. If you're less chance of being tested. Once, um, I, once I, guys, I'm just, I'm just getting my injection out. Once I, yeah. time, yeah. Yeah. So, so the, it's a, it's a, definitely an interesting time from that point of view. 
then yeah, from, yeah, from, yeah. from 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 the IPL's perspective, uh, and I'm I'm getting this conversation back to the IPL. Uh, what do you suppose they need to be most wary of in this second decade, where they, they'll probably grow even more as far as broadcast money is concerned, as far as teams are making money is concerned, players making money. Uh, what do you suppose they need to be most wary of? So I guess the the biggest risk, perhaps, the IPL is oversupply and, and saturating the market and d- d- diluting the sense that every IPL game is an event, which it still feels like we have a 60-game season. But mm. you've seen a lot of sports leagues and then some T20 leagues. Like, the, the Big Bash used to have that feel of every game being an event and it's really suffered from overexpansion and it's diluted itself. Although, that, that said, I think there is scope for the IPL to expand to, to 10 teams and the quality would still be very high, but it needs to be careful the way it, the way it does that. I think it needs to, you know, maintain vigilance about, you know, things like owners, about, you know, fixing on, on doping as well. Um, but I mean, the, the IPL is in a great position because you have the, the rise of the middle class in India, you know, and they, they love they love the IPL. They've obviously oh. got the more, more money now than ever before. So that that's why the t- TV ratings are going through the roof and also the worth of advertising, tickets, etc. everything. The IPL is in a fantastic position. I actually think it could be much more ambitious in terms of what it does on a global level. So, you know, who's to say, we're seeing some leagues taking matches abroad. Who's to, say the, who's to say the IPL can, you know, maybe play a tournament opener in a, in a different country sometimes or oh. fun or whatever. That would be an interesting event. I think we might also see, which would be very interesting, IPL teams as Kolkata Knight Riders have done with with, uh, with Trinidad in the Caribbean Premier League. We might see more IPL teams basically invest and buy other teams, and that could be really interesting. And what personally, what I'd love to see is Indian players be allowed to play abroad at the moment. Yeah, don't think that's happening in other T20 leagues which is actually short-sighted from India's point of view because India would be a better T20 team if their players are played in the Big Bash with a World Cup there in a few few months time mm. India players have played hardly any T20 in Australia if, they, if lots of them had a season or two there they India would have more chance of winning that tournament so yeah. that is short-sighted from the BCCI they, they, they are actually hampering their national team's chances and in terms of you know, answering that question we talked about earlier, why have India not been a bit more successful in T20? The lack of overseas experience is a big, big factor. Um, we've seen Indian players in first class cricket, you know, go to India, and that's been important in their development. And we've seen India become much better away from home in, in Test cricket. Um, I think if India were, will allow their players to, to go abroad and play in, in foreign leagues, that would be for the betterment of the Indian team. So that that would be a, a smart move. But as you said, there doesn't seem to be any sign of that coming soon. I, I we we talk keep about it. this quite often in the context of uh, football uh, in India because there the issue is that players aren't being able to develop because they aren't getting enough competitive games in a season. So, where, where in Europe you're playing 40-50 games a season, here you're getting yeah. barely 20-25 games. Yeah. Uh, and with cricket, it's, uh, I guess, in some ways the opposite because there, there are that many more talented players in the system who are probably world-class or thereabouts, at least first-class uh, levels. And there's so many competitions going on all over the world, but yet we're not letting our players go and play. It, it's uh, it's uh, quite an amazing contrast. Yeah, um, yeah, it, it is. And it, it gets to the, the heart of why you haven't won a World Cup since 2007 in T20. So we saw, I think, from 2012 to 16, the five players in the world who played the most T20 games were all from the West, West Indies. Indies. And the West Indies win those two World Cups in 2012 mm-hmm. and 16. So they have the most experience in all conditions, which is why actually when West Indies play in India, it's almost like they're playing at home. They know, they know those conditions so, so well. So you see lots of the top West Indies players now will play 40 to 20 games a year around the mm-hmm. world. And you think of how those their skills are developing and how the format's evolving so, so rapidly. Mm-hmm. Top Indian players, even with international games, Games will play 20, 25 games a year, and that that's quite a big deficit. It's basically a practice deficit, which is getting bigger with every year, and that is a problem for India. For all the, you know, India obviously has a talent pool unprecedented amongst all countries in the world. It's, you know, so many people, you know, that the quality of cricket being produced is going through the roof. The quality of domestic players is going through the roof. But I think to get to the next level, being allowed to play abroad would be a massive thing. And India could even say, what well, would be great if India said. If they identified maybe five or six players who they said we're going to be T20 specialists, and we think oh. for Indian cricket it's better for us if you play in the Big Bash yeah. rather than play for India A or whatever. They obviously no. players who play in all formats who are quite few anyway. There's not enough time for them realistically to play in foreign leagues. But for the you know for Washington Sunder, it, it's better for him to play in the Big Bash and in the T20 Blast than playing than being in India basically. 
Um, and, and India has to recognize that. And the reverse also, like these guys were chatting about why domestic cricket in India is not, the Ranji Trophy in particular is not so popular, people are not watching and, and all of that. So one of the suggestions was that uh, they should have a couple of foreign players who are playing in those uh, domestic sides in India. So like a, an exchange of sorts or whatever, where, where they will, because to see those players who, who uh, small town tier to India, doesn't get to see otherwise, they'll come for that player. It'll, it'll help popularize the domestic game, make it more viable uh, and also give the, some of these players who want to play in the subcontinent exposure because, I mean, then it opens up all kinds of opportunities, I think. For that's, yeah, that's a fantastic idea. So who's to say India can go to the Big Bash or the T20 or the 100 tournament as it is now and say, you know, we are happy to let four or five Indian players play in this competition in exchange we can let some English or Australian players play in the Ranji Trophy. That would be good. That would be good for everybody, actually. It'd yeah. be bad for the other countries that weren't part of that deal. It'd be good for everyone because if you're, you know, we talked earlier about how lots of foreign leagues have suffered from the lack of Indian players because it means they're not going to get many viewers from India. But if you had half a dozen top Indian players playing in the Big Bash or the T20 or the 100 tournament, we would see viewing figures for that skyrocket. Um, yeah. So those leagues. That would be fantastic for those leagues, and it would actually, as I said, it'd be very good for those Indian players being exposed. Um, and yeah, who's to say you couldn't have some some you know foreign players playing in the Ranji Trophy as well? That'd be interesting as well. So yeah, that's, that's what I mean about the IPL and also Indian cricket in the years ahead. I think if it can kind of have a bit more of a globalist mindset, that will actually help it on the field to get to the next level as well. Final question, Tim. Uh, final two, in fact. Uh, one in the first decade, in which you mentioned in your book as well, and uh, you know it's pretty obvious that uh, the mercenary player. Uh, and I'm, I'm yeah. terming it the mercenary player. The acceptance of the mercenary player hasn't come a total, right? So there are a few who are accepting it. Some are still in transition mode, and some are still going. You are not a cricket player. You know, you're not the purest. Kind it's of Michael player. Holding says to Kieran, says to Kieran yes. Pollard, famously, which we quote I, now. But, I, I, yeah. I love, I love Michael Holding though. I do love Michael Holding. Love listening to him. You love Michael Holding, but <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Anyway, but Kieran Pollard now, Arne of Arne's, he's now the West Indies captain in T20 and ODI cricket. Exactly. So, so is, that second decade, you reckon? Is that going to be the acceptance of the mercenary player? I think where... many of us have got there already, where we we accept it as a as a way of life and a fair career choice. But I think in in certain countries there's still this snobbery. So we talk with Chris Lynn, the, the Australian player, yeah. and he says, you know, some people still kind of look at me differently because I don't want to wear a baggy green moral tinge where it's seen as inferior to embrace T20 ahead of Test cricket. But we see now with, with young players, I mean, this applies both with Indian players, but also other players around the world. So with, say, with Tom Banton from England, you know, d does Tom Banton need Test cricket? He could have a brilliant, brilliant career, play the World T20 World Cup for England. He could play, he's already got an IPL contract, play brilliant leagues around the world. I mean, that's a great life. It's a great career, earned a lot of money, very fulfilling, lots of challenges. So does he, does he need Test cricket? So I think, I think, I think that acceptance is there and it, it will grow. And people who, you know, who kind of denigrate the skills or choices of, of T20 freelance players, they're kind of living in the dark, dark ages. They need to kind of wake up and, and smell the coffee, really. And finally, the, the, the bumper question, uh, which format do you see T20 impacting most now? Uh, is it the ODI format or the test format going forward? I, no, I think I, it's the I, 50 over. So I, I actually think all three formats can coexist together. And one of the interesting things, T20 has led to positive change in the other formats. So obviously you see that in ODI cricket, the scores rising, but we also see that in the structure yeah. of the tournament. So the fact mm -hmm. we have we have a new ODI league, we have a new World Test Championship, that kind of comes from pressure that's been put on it from mm -hmm. T20 cricket. The fact we have day-night test cricket, that probably wouldn't have come without T20 cricket. So in some ways, T20 has helped the other formats. And personally, I think all three formats can help together. I think... I think the World Cup in ODI cricket has got a its reputation is is fantastic and it's it's probably the tournament players want to win the most even more than the T20 World Cup or the IPL. But I think the problem for ODI cricket is what does it do in those four years between tournaments to to remain as relevant as possible? And that that's where T20 has been a great example for other league for other formats of the game because it the structure of it is very clear to understand. You have a league and you get a winner after six months, whereas you have a you know. India Sri Lanka ODI series. You know, so what? What does that really matter? What, what does it count towards? And that's what other international cricket needs to get better at answering. What does this matter towards? And that's why having leagues that are really easy to understand is going to be a really part of international cricket remaining popular and and, and bringing in, in bucks basically. Uh, Any, you have something to add? Uh, so just uh, 
Say no, goodbye. just just today the news is. Uh, I mean, it, it's not much news, but like indefinitely postponed the IPL. What's yeah. the sort of uh, reaction there in England among cricketers who are looking to play, and as, as well as from fans that are, that were looking forward to the tournament? Yeah, you you said Sky numbers are huge, right? Sky gets huge numbers on the IPL. So yeah, and we're actually seeing the numbers for the IPL in England have really grown in recent years, which speaks to the acceptance I talked about. It's also because there's more English players playing. I think I think this year there's a, there's 11 players, um, so they'll be very very sad they're missing out on their pay packets. But obviously there's a possibility of the tournament being being postponed this year. And I think although it's a domestic tournament, it's worth to the cricket economy is is such that there will be a lot of support for rearranging it even in a, a bridge form later in the year. People. Look at that window in September, October. That's certainly a possibility. Hmm. Uh, Tim Bigmore, once again, thank you so much for your time, guys. Also, to all the people who are watching the show, do go read that book. Uh, Freddie Wild, Tim Bigmore, come together to write Cricket 2.0. We're explaining the evolution of the 2020 game. And a big chunk of that is the IPL. Guys, uh, just uh, Tim, could you tell all the people who are watching this, where can they find your book? I found it on my Kindle. So it's pretty easy to buy. I think 600 odd rupees. Anywhere else? Yeah, so it's available on, on Amazon India, um, both on Kindle and to order the, the hardback copy. Um, so it's out now. Um, and yeah, we think there's, there'll be lots to enjoy for all Indian cricket fans and hopefully some nice distraction during these very peculiar times. Thank you so much, Tim. Lovely chatting with you. Thanks. Really enjoyed that. Cheers. Thank you.